Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the Jan Accommodation and Compliance Series webcast titled Ask Jan Expert Q&A. My name is Tracy DeFridis. Before we begin, we have some housekeeping items to cover. First, if you experience technical difficulties during this training, please use the question and answer option at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. You can contact Jan at 800-526-7234 or use the live chat at askjan.org. We also offer an FAQ that may answer some of your questions at the link provided here. Uh, this FAQ is linked in the email that you received with the event login information and on the webcast registration page. Next questions for the presenters may be submitted during the event by using the Q&A option located at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be gathered into a queue and answered during the Q&A period at the end of the webcast. PowerPoint slides can be accessed using the link included in the webcast chat or download them from the webcast event section on the JAN training page at askjan.org. That's A-S-K-J-A-N dot O-R-G. To access captioning, use the closed caption option at the bottom of the webcast window. A copy of the captioning transcript will be available with the archived webcast. This presentation is being recorded and will eventually be available on the askjan.org website. And finally, at the end of the presentation, an evaluation will automatically pop up on your screen in another window. Uh, keep the JAN webcast window open when the webcast ends. Uh, we appreciate your feedback. So if you would please complete the evaluation, this CEU approval code will be provided after the evaluation is completed. Now let's get started with this Ask Jan expert Q&A session. Uh, we'll start with information we've prepared based on our questions uh, that we've received uh, before this webcast, but our experts will field ADA and accommodation questions on the spot later. I'm excited to be joined by Jan's lead consultants today. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with these colleagues for many years, and it's my pleasure to introduce Melanie Wetzel, Jan's mental health condition expert and lead consultant on the cognitive neurological team, Teresa Goddard, our AT expert and lead on the sensory team, and finally, Lisa Mathis, lead on the motor team and a fellow ADA specialist. Thank you all for joining today. As a start, let's address some ADA and accommodation questions that fall into three categories. So back to the basics, return to work, and of course, future, work, future of work issues. Um, a small disclaimer, Jan is not a legal service, of course, and uh, we don't provide legal guidance. The information that we're sharing here today is based on formal ADA guidance provided by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, and also Jan's 38 years of experience as a leader providing practical ADA guidance and accommodation solutions. Now participants, please use the Q&A option located at the bottom of your screen to submit questions anytime during the discussion. So let's get started. Does everyone remember when job accommodation and ADA questions didn't include the phrase because of COVID? <laughs> Flashing back to that time, some questions, uh, they were a little bit different back then, um, but still complex and trending with the times, of course. Uh, tested accommodation practices and ADA interactive process strategies are informing the decisions that we're making today. So let's take a step back to the basics, starting with some topics related to engaging in the interactive process. Now, when recognizing when the ADA is triggered, it's important. It's, it's central to ADA compliance. And so here's a question we've received. Uh, an employee provided a note from their healthcare provider that says telework is recommended because the employee is considered high risk for severe illness from COVID due to a medical condition. So this person wanted to know, when is the ADA interactive process triggered? You have to remember the basics. When an employee requests a work-related change for a reason related to their own medical condition, this is an ADA accommodation request. 
And there's no mention of ADA or accommodation, but there's that nexus between a medical impairment causing a problem and a work-related barrier. Next, the employer may need to gather some information about the disability and the need for accommodation in order to figure out if the ADA applies. So now we need to consider some questions we've received related to medical inquiries with situation two. And gathering information is step two in the interactive process, and it involves sticking to the basic ADA rules related to medical inquiries. Melanie, you're our cognitive neurological team expert. So you address a lot of questions about individuals with mental health conditions. Um, we know it's not always clear how much medical information will be helpful to provide accommodations and employers really need to know how much information is enough or, or too much sometimes. Um, here's a situation for you. An employee asks for a reassignment to another position that won't cause as much stress. The medical documentation submitted states that the employee should be moved to a stress-free position. Uh, the employer doesn't know where to start. Um, what does this mean? How would you advise the employer in this situation? Well, it's, it's a really good question because what does it mean? I, I'm not sure what that means. It's really vague. There's no medical condition listed. Um, you know, everyone experiences stress. I think probably most jobs are stressful. What stresses me is not going to stress you or the next person necessarily. And so I think it's a really good idea for the employer to, to get some more medical information that would clarify uh, what the medical condition is, what are some of the limitations besides stress, maybe some accommodation ideas. I think that probably the best thing to do is to have a full conversation with the employee and talk about specific ideas for stress. What is it specifically that's stressing you in this position? You know, ADA guidance would say that the employer would want to accommodate the person or try to accommodate them fully in the position they're in before they try to reassign if they don't know what's causing stress in this job, how can they put them in another job? I mean, you know, you don't know what's going to be stressful in the next job, and then it could be an, another job and another job. So what we try to talk to employers and, and individuals when they call, too, is what is it specifically that's causing this stress? The employer really needs to know that so that they can look at reducing that stress or eliminating that stress. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, do note that Jan does offer some more information on this type of topic at askjan.org. If you go to the A to Z by topic, you'll see some information on medical exams and inquiries. And we have a lot of resources at the bottom of that page that uh, you might find helpful. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's another situation, number three. An employee submits medical documentation to a supervisor a week after being written up during a performance review. Uh, medical documentation states the employee has difficulty with concentration and memory, but it doesn't offer suggestions for accommodations, and the employee didn't suggest anything on their own during the performance meeting. Uh, Melanie, still looking at you for some guidance on this one. Um, how can an employer determine effective accommodations when the medical information only lists limitations and the employee hasn't really asked for anything specific? Well, that, that's, that's another good question. I'll say there are probably three three things that, that the employee, the employer can go back to the doctor and get some clarifying information about what might be helpful. They might include some information about the problematic job tasks. When we first talk about accommodations with people, we talk about what's most difficult on the job that's disability related. You know, what are you having the most difficulty doing? And that's where we usually start. And so I would say, you know, if there's a performance review, they're going to have some issues with performance. They can start right there. You know, you say that the, this person has difficulty with concentration and memory. Can you help us with some accommodation ideas that will help with these job tasks? Um, you can also have that full conversation with the employee. Talk again about what do you need? You know, some employees, I think, need to be prompted and into that discussion. A lot of employees know exactly what they need, and some don't have any idea what they need. And so I think having that full conversation, though, and talk about, let's say, the, the employee's having... Uh, trouble um, writing reports and getting them done on time. Okay, let's talk about that. How do we help you? You, you? you know, if you have concentration and memory issues, what do we do to help you get those reports done on time? Would a template help? You know, do you need more uh, quiet space or, or privacy? Or, you know, what is it that would help you do those? And then I think the third option would be to contact Janet. That's what we do all day long. We talk to employers. Uh, we talk to individuals. 
uh, both people can call and get ideas. And sometimes I think it's it's easier for the employee to call and talk to someone at Jan. It's a little less stress, I think, than talking to their supervisor about it. And they might tell us some things about the job or some things about their difficulties that they don't want to talk about to their employer. And maybe we can help them probe and, and find some good ideas that would help them. Excellent guidance, Melanie. And you're really making that point. You know, that interactive process is interactive. We're together. Um, so, I, so I think that that's just great, great guidance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so next, let's still keep with back to basics, but moving to a complex issue on the next slide. Uh, workplace accessibility, namely parking. Uh, while work location has kind of changed for many workers due to the pandemic, workplace accessibility issues, they still exist. We have some questions related to parking requirements and access to facilities. So Lisa, it's your turn. Let's say an employee requests accessible parking, but the employer believes the parking lot meets ADA guidelines for the number of spaces. The employer thinks they can deny the request. What do you think? Okay, when an employer contacts Jan just wanting to deny a request, you know, I'm going to encourage all employers to be like, okay, if we're going to deny this, let's look at other alternative options. You don't just want to shut down the interactive process. But back to your question about the parking lot. So an employer controlled parking lot, really the, you're looking at bare minimum guidelines, which are the ADA accessibility guidelines. And that's a base level of physical accessibility, a bare minimum in most cases. So on top of that bare minimum standard, under Title I, the employment realm, employees and employers may have to engage in that interactive process to see what a specific employee truly needs to gain access to that parking lot and gain access to that building. And that may be more than what that ADA accessibility guidelines says. Um, so it's really gonna be that unique case-by-case -case determination. So let's assume that that parking lot is um, compliant with the accessibility guidelines, but the employee with the disability can't walk the distance from the accessible parking space to the worksite entrance. An employer would need to consider accommodations absent hardship. So sometimes employees may not need, even need a true accessible spot. They might just need a reserve parking spot that's closer to their workstation that's within their walking restriction. So common accommodations for parking stuff in closer um, parking spaces is either moving the parking spot closer to where they're going to gain access to that building or um, moving the workstation closer to the door that's closer to the parking lot. And oftentimes that's that side door that we use for deliveries. So it might not be the typical employee entrance, but it's close to the parking lot. And that might be something that would be conducive for an employee with a disability. Um, and then removing the barrier of parking completely. That's whenever we're looking at telework or reassignment to a different location. All those things could be considered whenever we're looking at parking issues. Good stuff, but I think it's important, you know, you're making that point, it's really case by case. You might have to go above and beyond what a standard says you need to do in order to ensure that, that an individual employee has access to the work environment. So good tips there. Uh, also parking issues are they're kind of tricky. Uh, so for more on this topic, you can see askjan.org, the A to Z by topic of parking for some commonly asked questions to help you work through those issues. Uh, Lisa, let's look at another workplace access question. Uh, we have an employee who says the front door is too heavy to open, but it meets, again, the ADA guidelines. Are, are we still compliant with ADA? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> okay, so that door, that push-pull force, that may be conducive to that accessibility guidelines. Again, that's the base level. But say you have an employee that comes, had a stroke, has left side paralysis, or like just uh, body weakness, so they still can't use their push pull force to open that door that is compliant. You're going to have to look at. Um, can you hear me? We hear a little bit of an echo. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I know. Okay. So under Title One, I'm going to hope this works itself out. Uh, an employer does need to assess the situation to explore alternative accommodation ideas. And whether that's to replace the door in its entirety, there's assistive technologies out there that could be a retrofit to the existing door to lighten that load, um, automatic door openers. So we can definitely explore some tech options to 
not only be compliant with the accessibility guideline um, access, but also be functional and effective for that individual that happens to have some weakness uh, limitations. So if you want to talk specific tech stuff, don't hesitate to reach out to JAN consultants. All right, more good information. Thanks for clearing up that compliance issue. Uh, and sounds like the gremlin is uh, taking care of itself. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next situation. Uh, Teresa, you're up with the next situation, number five. So let's talk about good old fashioned equipment and technology related accommodation requests. Uh, headset woes are common workplace problem, especially for employees who are hard of hearing. Uh, it isn't as, as easy as it used to be to kind of simply let employees try a different headset to find out what works best. Uh, this is an opportunity to explore options that are best suited to meet an employee's needs rather than just good enough to get by, right? So in some cases, uh, the best listening solution may not even resemble a traditional headset. But here's a question for the Jan Sensory team. Uh, I have an employee who uses hearing aids and doesn't like their telephone headset. Uh, what headset should I get for this employee? What guidance can you offer about exploring equipment or technology and as, as an accommodation? Oh boy, Tracy, I could talk about this all day, but I will try to restrain myself. <laughs> So we actually get this question all the time. Employers are like, they don't like their headset. We've tried three different headsets and they don't like any of them. Let me tell you this. If you have an employee who is using hearing aids, they probably shouldn't be using a headset at all. <laughs> the best solution for them is probably going to depend on the type of hearing aids that they use. So what you really need to do if you want to make the best possible listening situation happen for this individual is find out what kind of hearing aids they use. What's the brand? What's the model number? If the person has the option to contact their audiologist and the audiologist is knowledgeable about connecting to a workplace phone system, that's a lot of ifs. But uh, if all of that falls into place, listen to what the audiologist has to say. But you know what I hear all the time? I hear all the time that either people have moved across the country and they don't have a new audiologist yet, uh, or their audiologist was great at setting up the hearing aids but doesn't really understand this phone problem. They're like, well, just use your iPhone. These, these hearing aids are designed to work great with iPhones. Well, that'd be great if I was allowed to have my iPhone at work, right? So reaching out to the audiologist is a great first step, but it doesn't always work out. What you can do is find out the brand and the model and go to the website of the company that makes the hearing aids, and you're going to be able to see the features of that hearing aid. If it has Bluetooth connectivity, if it has a telecoil that you can use with a neck loop, and you can usually even contact somebody at that company to find out what's the best way to connect to this particular kind of hearing aid to an office phone. Now, will you occasionally get situations where somebody has hearing aids that don't have those features? Yeah, that can happen. And sometimes, yes, you do wind up um, sort of um, carefully perching a headset on somebody's head, trying to get the, the sweet spot, if you will, where they can hear as well as they possibly can without getting a lot of feedback, but it's not ideal. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna be looking for some type of accessory or a neck loop to use with the hearing aid, but you really have to know what kind of hearing aid you're dealing with in order to make it all work. So that's the short version. <laughs> it's a lot of technical stuff there. Uh, it's probably a, a good reason to contact Jan for more information, but Teresa, you know I have a follow-up question. Does Jan recommend equipment or services? I knew you were gonna ask that, <laughs> Tracy. No, Jan, Jan doesn't recommend or endorse specific products or services. What we do is try to put you in contact with options so that you can decide on your own what's the best option to pursue for your employee or for yourself. But if anybody is having an issue out there with their headset or they would just like to hear on the phone a little bit better, you can always give Jan a call. I'd be happy to chat anytime. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Okay, let's move on to the next situation. Um, actually, next category. So we're talking a lot these days about return to work plans. Uh, many employers planned a, a phased return to work to start in September, but with the surge of COVID infection rates, many return to work plans have stalled. 
uh, with new dates falling in November or even January 2022 for that matter. Uh, return to work issues, they vary, and we know you have questions about these topics, so um, please feel free to use the Q&A to, to send in your questions. We'll get to those here soon. But let's consider some we've already received and on some topics that you're probably thinking about. Uh, Melanie, you're back on. Um, telework, it can be a highly effective accommodation for a lot of people with cognitive and neurological impairments, and it proved to be effective during the pandemic. Some employers really want employees back to work, though. Um, we've been hearing variations of this kind of situation, so situation six here. Uh, an employee with panic disorder asked to continue teleworking after her employer ends mandatory telework related to the pandemic, and they call all employees back to work. Uh, the employer tells the employee she'll need to come into the office the same as everyone else until the interactive process is complete. Is that the best approach? Well, I, I'm going to say no. I, I, I don't think it is in, in this case. A um, couple reasons. Um, there's a modified workplace policy under the ADA that says an employer can make a modification or a change in a policy for someone with a disability that they don't make for others. And it could be to allow somebody to remain at home when they're calling everybody back, um, even if it's on a temporary basis. You know, that return to work, we've had so many questions. It, it's not a one size fits all. There are lots of different factors that go into that, that not everybody's ready to come back at the same time uh, due to disabilities. Um, I, I would say to what would be important to, to consider this employee, was their teleworking performance good? And if it was good, then why not let that continue? You know, change is not easy for most of us. And for people with disabilities, it can be really difficult. And if somebody has a panic disorder and maybe they've been working from home and, and they've got it managed, and then a quick sudden change could, could uproot that management and cause issues. And I don't think any employer wants to do that. Um, if the employee can continue to work at home and be productive, that would be much more beneficial to both of them. If the employee starts having panic attacks, uh, you know, that could affect her performance. It could affect her attendance when really, you know, she might be able to stay at home. And then they can consider that on a temporary basis. Let's do this until we get the accommodation process finished and, and let's see what happens. You know, and if there were any kind of a performance issue, they're saying, well, you know, that should have been addressed along the way, not right now. But even if there is any kind of an issue with performance, that can be addressed at the same time that they allow her to stay at home and work. Well, that sounds like a good plan. That way she can continue to work and uh, they can work through that process and, and see how things go. All right. Thanks, Melanie. I'm going to move on to the next situation here. Teresa, you're back up. Um, Many employers are encouraging employees to return to on-site work, of course. However, some employees don't yet feel like there's, it's safe to return. Uh, the sensory team also fields questions on immune system issues. So this includes medical issues are, um, that can impact the effectiveness of vaccines. So let's explore this situation. Uh, an employer says that an employee who had a heart transplant wants to keep teleworking, but they had two shots already. And the employer thinks that this person should be able to return to work and they want to know why the employee needs to stay home. Um, thoughts on this kind of situation? I think you're muted still, Teresa. Thank you. Better? I'm so glad that you brought this up, Tracy. This is such a timely issue and it is something that we are hearing about. And as you know, organ transplantation is an issue that's very close to, to my heart. Um, a lot of people with transplants are getting questions about this from their employers. When will you be ready? You've had two shots. Uh, it happens that almost everyone who has an organ transplant, who's been through the procedure, and has received a solid organ transplant has to take a lifelong regimen of immunosuppressive therapy. And this often involves um, heavy doses of steroids that can cause a lot of other problems like uh, increasing someone's risk for diabetes. But the research that we're seeing shows that many organ transplant recipients don't develop antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, 
uh, at the same rate or in the same way as other people who have received a complete authorized COVID-19 vaccine regimen. So this means somebody could have their, their two shots of an mRNA vaccine, but they're not producing as many antibodies as the average person who had those same two vaccines. So because of that, um, the FDA is allowing people who have had solid organ transplants and had two shots of an mRNA vaccine to go ahead and get a third in the hopes that that's going to increase the level of antibodies that they're able to produce so that they're better protected. So that's the logic behind somebody who might need a third shot. Some people are able to get the third shot very easily, and some have been having some issues with trying to get that third shot scheduled. But there are really good reasons why a person who has a solid organ transplant and has only had two shots might not be safe to return yet. And the truth is, we don't even know for sure how well these third shots are going to work. There's ongoing research with kidney transplant recipients at Johns Hopkins, and we'll just have to see how that research turns out before we know if a third shot is really even going to work well. I hope that helps. It does, absolutely, and I think it's a, a good reason to make sure we're thinking about accommodations case by case. Take a look at the situation, understand the facts of the situation. Uh, for, for employers who are trying to figure out how to go through or process telework accommodation requests, uh, Jan's put together a new resource, a practical approach to telework as a reasonable accommodation during the pandemic. It's something that can be used all the time, not just in the middle of a pandemic, but, uh, but you really wanna kind of take a look at everything case by case and, and think about it from a practical standpoint as well. Is it something that is going to enable someone to keep working? All right, thanks so much, Teresa. It's something we're hearing a lot about right now. All right, let's move to situation eight. Lisa, you're back in the hot seat. Um, this next topic touches on something that we're also receiving a lot of questions about, and that's processing vaccine exemption uh, accommodation requests related to a medical condition. Uh, we did get a lot of these questions come in. So uh, many employees returning to onsite work, they're required to be fully vaccinated. Um, employers are looking for help gathering information to review these requests. And employers are asking if there's an ADA form of some kind to request medical information for this specific purpose. Can you help us out with that? Of course, <laughs> the Q&A lit up when we went to this vaccination slide, so <laughs> buckle up. Okay, so as far as a form goes, there's not a standard or required form for requesting any medical documentation per ADA, not only the vaccine exemption. So there are templates that employers can use to create their own and um, kind of examples that are out there. So there's a um, template made available by the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force to develop a form to be provided to employees who are seeking an exemption for vaccination requirements due to a medical reason. This is just an example, it's not a required form. And I do think it's important to mention that um, any medical information that we're getting on these forms for these exemptions, that should be treated like any other confidential medical record. It should be in a separate um, place from the employee's personnel files. So we do want to handle these um, confidential records with care, as we always have. COVID um, and vaccinations make that no different. Very helpful. Um, and we do, Jan does have this particular resource linked. If you go to askjan.org and access our COVID page right off the homepage, you'll find this template and many other relevant resources that uh, might be helpful if you're having to process these types of requests. Uh, so thanks, Lisa. We appreciate it. Okay, let's move to the last category and then we will work our way into uh, sort of the live Q&A session. Um, so we're finishing up with this last category uh, of future of work because it's what a lot of people are thinking about right now. Uh, em emerging trends like hybrid and remote work and a focus on workplace well-being. Um, these are now future of work issues because of the pandemic. So maybe these were things that were kind of up and coming, but were really brought to the forefront now. Uh, the future of work, it really is hybrid, and it's about facilitating an environment where employees with disabilities can thrive and feel valued. Uh, we've received questions related to these topics uh, to address today, and I'm sure we'll have more to address here soon. Um, so let's take a look at a few situations around this future of work topic. Uh, Lisa, 
back on, uh, leading the motor team, you frequently advise on workstation equipment issues. Um, here's the situation. Some employees who are working hybrid are asking for the same workstation equipment at home that they were provided at the workplace as an accommodation. Is this required when employees with disabilities are working a hybrid schedule? What do you think? <laughs> oh, equipment. So equipment issues for teleworking employees, pre-COVID, it was hairy, it was complex, and it was never formally addressed by the EEOC. So now that we're looking at this new hybrid telework workforce, what employers have to furnish as far as equipment goes, it can be complex and it should be handled again by that case by case determination, meaning that employer should engage in that interactive process if the ADA is triggered. And um, there is an EEOC guidance that specifically says for pandemic situations, it's in the pandemic preparedness guidance from EEOC. And they specifically do say that during a pandemic, if an individual with a disability needs that same reasonable accommodation at a telework site that was previously provided in the workplace, an employer should furnish that absent undue hardship, of course. So if such a request is made, an employer and employee should discuss what the employee needs and why, and whether the same or a different accommodation could suffice in that home setting. So an employee, um, we might already have equipment or furniture at home that could be conducive and meeting our disability related limitations at home. So we might not have to completely recreate our office workstations at home, but we might need to um, get creative, think outside the box, call Jan for, you know, DIY options or product uh, ideas to meet those disability related limitations that have stemmed from working at home. So really just kind of opening up that dialogue, see what they need to be successful, to be continuing to um, perform and be efficient as an employee. I think that's what's most important. Okay, that's really helpful. It, it is a complex issue. I think that, um, you know, you've provided some sound advice on that. So hopefully uh, people will have what they need in both places if, if it is reasonable. Okay, let's keep moving on here. Uh, Teresa. Uh, remote meetings and trainings, they seem to be here to stay. And we I definitely think these are going to be uh, sort of the, this is a way we're going to be working in the future uh, as we are now. So uh, some employers say this mode, is, it's been a time saver for their organization. So they're keeping this practice in place indefinitely. Uh, some workers even prefer them, but it can be challenging to make them accessible to all staff. So in this situation, um, Employers often ask if automated captioning is a good option for making virtual meetings accessible. Can we offer some insight on this topic? I would love to. So is automated captioning a good option for making virtual meetings accessible? We get this question all the time um, at the Jana Com at the, the Job Accommodation Network on the sensory team. And the truth is it depends on the meeting and it depends on the person. There are certainly times when automated captioning can be a good enough option. And sometimes it's a really great backup option too. But you have to consider both the content of the meeting and the needs of the individual who is receiving those captions as an accommodation when you're selecting the best option for your meeting. It's popular to use automated captioning because it's convenient. Uh, you don't have to worry about a lot of scheduling. The cost is low compared with um, other types of human assisted options. But automated captionings could be less effective than remote CART or video remote, remote interpreting in situations where there's something complex that you're talking about, where there's a lot of technical jargon. Also, people's accents and dialects can really impact how effective and accurate that transcription is. If there are equipment issues or background noise like what we experience today, automated captioning doesn't have um, the human intelligence to stop and course correct and to filter out unwanted noise. Um, it's getting better all the time. It's just not up to the same level yet, but a human captioner who you can brief in advance about the subject matter and the keywords, who's familiar with the speakers, that's well worth the investment in time and money to get your best captioning results. And also remember that a video remote interpreter is likely to be more effective than either automated captioning or CART 
if you have participants who primarily use American Sign Language or ASL. So one thing that we've seen is a combined approach where an employer might offer both CART and interpreting. And I've also seen automated captioning offered as like a backup option. So they'll have automated captions running all the time, but also have a video remote interpreter present. And the advantage of that is that if there's some kind of hiccup or glitch and the interpreter loses their, um, their feed of the meeting, then people can still kind of get by until the person is able to get back online and start interpreting again. So great backup option, sometimes a good enough option, but sometimes you really have to dig a little deeper and look for something a little bit more accurate. Okay, really helpful that it, it takes some time to figure these sorts of things out and for sure. sometimes it's trial and error and who knows. So uh, if sometimes people have questions right. about that, they can, they can definitely call and talk to you. <laughs> All right, let's move to the next situation um, real quickly. 11. So let's look at uh, number 11. An employee has lupus and is also experiencing symptoms of long COVID, including fatigue, body aches, and brain fog. Um, this is something that we're starting to hear more about. Uh, with this question that came in, um, a previous request to telework was denied because they didn't, the employer didn't think that telework could work. Uh, but now the employee is requesting it again. And uh, Lisa, you know, what can you tell us about the effect of mandatory telework on the reasonableness of continuing telework as an accommodation? Yeah, so a lot of our jobs are kind of proving that they are more conducive to telework than we originally thought, you know, our jobs included. Um, so this 18 months, I think it's a good demonstration trial period for employees to really show their employer, hey, the essential functions are doable from home. I'm still performing up to par. The essential functions are getting done and I'm being able to take care of my disability. You know, we were kind of forced into the telework home and, you know, kind of adjusted there at the beginning, but now people are thriving and being better employees from the remote setting. So EEOC has said, um, you know, again, that case by case determination, I feel like a broken record, but not all jobs are going to be doable from home. So really assessing the specific job role, seeing are the essential functions doable from home? Can you perform them? Do you have the needed equipment? Um, because not all jobs are going to be doable from home. So again, that case by case determining if someone is able to continue telework past this mandatory COVID telework period. Um, and I think a lot of us are able to stay at home um, and really kind of flourish and employers are seeing the benefits of us working from home. So assuming that all requirements for such reasonable accommodation requests are satisfied, the temporary telework experience could be relevant in considering this renewed request for accommodation. So again, with all accommodation requests, that interactive um, process, that flexible cooperative interactive process moving forward to see, can we continue the telework arrangement. Okay, very good. Um, Lisa mentioned EEOC and some guidance they offer. That the EEOC has been updating the what you should know about COVID-19 and the ADA, the Rehab Act, and other EEO laws. It's been an excellent resource throughout the pandemic, so uh, certainly a resource to pay attention to uh, as you are starting to field more of these requests. All right, I think we're heading into our last situation and Melanie, I'm bringing you back on board. Uh, we're gonna okay. finish up with this uh, final future of work topic and then we'll hit your live questions. Uh, here's the situation number 12. An employee who has high anxiety and a mood disorder exacerbated by the pandemic requested to bring her support dog to work to help her cope with the daily stress that affects concentration and causes her to act erratically at times. Um, you know, we get a lot of service and emotional support animal questions, and I suspect that this may increase in the future as people are called back to work. Um, should an employer consider allowing an emotional support animal into the workplace in a situation like this? What are your thoughts? Yes, I, I think they should. I think they should go through that process as an accommodation request, the same as they would if somebody was asking for telework or flexible schedule or specialized computer uh, equipment, anything like that. You know, they can ask the questions the same, how will the telework help you do your job? How is the flexible schedule going to work? How is the dog really going to help? Um, a lot of questions employers have is, does the dog have to be certified, you know, 
do we have, can we ask for certification and training? The answer to that is no, because a lot of dogs aren't certified uh, in training. A lot of people train their own dogs. That may be effective and it may not be. Uh, you know, there's certification online that you can pay for and get, and it doesn't mean anything. So the best thing to do is think about, you know, can we do it on a trial basis? We are big proponents here at JAN on providing accommodations on a temporary or a trial accommodation. Set a time frame. Um, you know, if a dog is not trained, you're probably going to be able to, from, from some of the stories we've heard, you can tell in 15 or 20 minutes if that dog's going to be disruptive or not. Um, you can allow several weeks maybe to see if the dog's been trained properly, you know, it'll come in the workplace, you won't know it's there, and it could really make a difference for this employee and others. Um, it can calm anxiety, and if it's going to help her not act erratically, then I think it's definitely worth a try. You can put that in a you know, a written form, like a little contract that we're going to, we're going to do this temporarily or on a trial basis. And we're going to see what happens. And, you know, as long as the dog's not disruptive and we see that it works, then we'll consider on a more long-term basis. That's really sound advice. And I think that's something for everyone to kind of remember the idea that uh, temporary or trial accommodations can be very beneficial. It doesn't lock the employer into a situation that they're not sure is going to work. It gives uh, everyone a chance to figure out what's going to be effective. So it's certainly something we talk a lot about. And, and in this particular situation, it, it really uh, could be a way of ensuring that that animal can be in that work environment and, and certainly support that employee. So very good, very good advice there. Uh, Jane does offer some practical information related to allowing emotional support and service animals in the work environment. We've included a resource here uh, related to sort of a practical, practical approach to addressing those kinds of situations. So thanks so much, Melanie. Okay, it's time for some live questions. So um, I'm going to uh, take a look at what's come in here. Bear with me just a moment. See, I've been seeing that Q&A light up, and so I know we have some good questions in here. Let's see what we have going on. Okay. Melanie, here's one for you. Um, okay. Let's see. If an employee is saying that they have a panic disorder, but the, the, the medical documentation uh, doesn't address the inquiry on the restrictions and only says the employee has a serious health condition, so maybe the documentation isn't stating specifically what the impairment is. Um, does the employer have to accommodate with telework without having actual restrictions or functional limitations, information about that type of whatever impairment is involved? Um, that, that's a good question. And, you know, in, in some areas you can't ask for that information, what the exact impairment or the exact diagnosis is. I think it's good information to try or it's a good recommendation to try to get as much information as possible. That may be possible with just having that conversation with the employee. Like Lisa, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but you know, that full conversation with the employee can be really helpful. Um, if, you know, have you seen evidence of panic attacks or have you seen evidence that the employee's struggling? Um, you know, can you do the telework on a trial basis to see how it's going to work? Um, you know, a lot of times when people are at home, I'm not, I'm not saying telework's the answer, but for a lot of people with mental health conditions, uh, the ability to work from home can be very helpful because they can manage their own environment and it can, it can really reduce a lot of things that, uh, you know, make their conditions worse. So I would say, you know, you could go back to the doctor, get some more information. You could have that full uh, conversation with the employee. Okay. Very helpful. Uh, here's another one I'll throw out there. Um, for persons who are not able to tolerate mask wearing in the workplace, what would be considered a reasonable accommodation? And what would be a special accommodation in terms of a person's need for supplied air? So any, any thoughts on uh, mask, mask wearing and, and accommodations and some difficulties with doing that in the work environment? We've, we've certainly had that question a lot. Uh, for many months now. Well, you know, on, on the sensory team, we've been getting a lot of questions from people who want to continue teleworking because they can't tolerate masks well or perhaps can only tolerate them for short periods. Um, other employers are considering on-site solutions like offering a more private 
workspace where the person could perhaps uh, get some relief from their mask, retreat to that private workspace and take it off for a little while. Uh, there, there have been some questions about people who use oxygen and, and wear a mask, and often people are able to wear their nasal cannula under a mask, but um, there, there have been some reported issues with some of the oxygen concentrators that people use to get oxygen when they're away from home and, and how well the filters on those actually work. So a lot of people are trying to telework or working more privately. You can also look for alternate masks. There's a ton of different ones on the market. Okay. Very helpful. And, and we do certainly offer some more information related to um, masking and accommodations and limitations. So certainly check out the COVID page at askjan.org for more on that. Okay, here's just sort of a, an ADA general definition of disability type question. Uh, when is a broken arm or leg considered a disability? So probably something that's maybe more of a temporary impairment. Who wants to tackle that one? Lisa, okay. I'm kind of looking at you. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Um, I mean, Jan can't say whether any medical condition or disability, if it meets the definition of a disability, um, but with a broken leg, broken arm, there used to be language that if it was less than six months, it's not an ADA disability. Well, ever since the Amendments Act, that language has been removed. So temporary impairments, as long as they're su um, substantially limiting, then that can rise to the level of an ADA disability. So if there's a reason a broken leg is not healing appropriately because the person has that underlying physical impairment that makes healing of broken bones like problematic, that may rise to the level of an ADA disability. So not everyone that has a broken leg is gonna have an ADA disability, but there may be some cases that certain individuals because of uh, underlying factors, those may rise to the level of an ADA disability. Um, but I, like I tell all employers all day long, that definition of disability is so, so very broad, not to split hairs on the definition of disability, I think it's um, in good faith effort to kind of assume coverage and focus all your time and energy on is the accommodation reasonable and does it pose a hardship or not? Because um, it is just such a broad definition. Okay, very good. Uh, there was a mention here about us not really talking a whole lot about the need to uh, perform the essential duties of the job and the idea that an accommodation needs to enable that. And so I'm going to kind of feel this real quickly and just uh, make mention that certainly in any situation, providing an accommodation is about enabling that person to perform the essential job duties. If, if an individual is in a situation where they're unable to perform the essential job duties, the accommodation isn't going to allow for that. Telework's a good example. We get that a lot. Um, you know, maybe all of the essential functions aren't able to be performed at home, then 100% telework may not be a reasonable accommodation. Uh, an employer is not expected to remove essential job duties. So, so look at whether or not they can all be performed with that accommodation of telework. If not, then maybe there's a middle, of, middle, middle road type scenario there where some of the, the functions can be performed at home. Um, so they can be at home part of the time, but they might need to be on site in, in other uh, cases to perform certain duties. So Ultimately, at the end of the day, it is about being able to perform those essential job duties. So let's just keep that in mind, of course. Um, a question related to providing accommodation. So after an employee makes a formal request with documentation, um, is there a time frame that an employer has to respond to or provide accommodations under the ADA? There's not. Um, there's not a specific time frame. But EEOC has said unnecessary delays could be problematic and could be an ADA violation. So you really want to do your due diligence, try to keep that process moving, keep the employee informed. If, you've, if there's kind of a holding time of because you've ordered equipment, and we know that there's shipping delays. Communicate that with the employees so they don't feel like you've taken their request and ignored it completely. Uh, um, but there's not a hard, fast time frame for uh, furnishing accommodations but we do encourage all employers to do that as quickly as possible. Okay, very good. Uh, Melanie, this one's for you. Uh, if an employee has PTSD and it's triggered by the personality of one supervisor and not of another, who, is, who happens to be on a different team? 
uh, is it reasonable to request a supervisor change if all job tests are still completed? This is one we hear a lot about. So uh, what's your take on that one? Yeah, we do hear a lot about that. And, and EEOC guidance says that an employer does not have to change a supervisor as an accommodation. They can certainly go above and beyond the ADA, but they're not required to do that. But rather they could look at what is the supervisory method that needs to be changed. You know, could they change the way that the two interact and uh, make it more suitable for the two to work together? And if there really is a strong personality conflict and it can't be worked out, um, you know, there's nothing that says that they can't change that person uh, to another supervisor. Um, you know, we, we get requests for, I, I never want to talk to my supervisor. I don't, I don't know that that's, you know, going to be reasonable, but there are instances where you could have a lot more communication, especially when people are working remotely, uh, you know, by uh, email, you know, and not have face-to-face. -face. Maybe I don't want to see my supervisor face to face? Can I leave my camera off? You know, can I just get on a meeting and just hear, you know, not see people? So there, there are lots of different ways that, that you could look at reducing that uh, instance of the personality clash. Um, sometimes it's it's not as big of a deal as, as the employer might think. Uh, one example I can think of is, is the employee said that the supervisor just yelled at her all the time. When they talked to the supervisor, they found that wasn't the case. He just had this loud, booming voice that he talked to everyone that way. And she took that to mean that he was yelling at her. And so they, they just kind of worked that out. And she was they were able to remain working together. Okay. All right. That's really helpful. Uh, we, we're getting a lot of questions around religious and medical exemptions related to vaccination, mandatory uh, vaccination. Uh, obviously, this is something we're hearing a lot about right now. Uh, the, one of the questions here specifically referenced federal employers. And so I just want to draw everyone's attention again to that safer federal workforce uh, task force because they have put out some excellent information that's relevant to the federal workforce. So for questions related to medical exemptions and religious exemptions uh, in the vaccine for the federal government, that would be a, a great go-to. So please do take a look at that so you can kind of figure out um, you know, where you're needing to go in terms of being a federal government employer. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, Uh, so question related to allowing dogs in the workplace. What if uh, you have a situation where someone has allergies and um, the dog can't be in that environment or around that person who's allergies, I should say. Let me rephrase that. Uh, any thoughts on having to do with two different types of accommodation needs? Right. I, I would say that you would you'd look at both as accommodation needs, and you could get documentation from both people, the person with the allergies as well. And you look at, is it possible to accommodate both? You don't want to just accommodate one and not the other one, or the one who gets the request in first. You want to look at both of those. And there, there are lots of different options. We have a publication on our website about that. I mean, you can look at uh, products that can help, uh, different locations. Can one person telework? Um, you know, can they be placed far apart, not necessarily isolated, but kind of isolated, different paths of travel. Um, you know, can the dog be left behind if there was a meeting where both of them would have to attend? You know, there are lots of different options like that. Okay, very good. Uh, I think, let's see here, throw another one out here uh, related to COVID and vaccination, of course, a uh, question about what sort of documentation or proof might someone be able to provide in order to get a medical exemption for vaccination because of a disability, because I'm not able to, to receive the vaccine? What sort of information might an individual provide related to that? So a vaccine uh, exemption, that's gonna be handled just like any other ADA accommodation request. If the need and disability is not obvious, then we're entitled to limited medical documentation. One piece of that is to establish, does this person have an ADA disability? Do they have that underlying physical or mental impairment that is the reason that they can't get that um, COVID vaccine? 
Um, so you're entitled to limited information and supporting documentation to kind of see what's going on, why can't they get the vaccine. Um, if they ever can, it might be a temporary issue where in the future, they can't get the vaccine right now, give us three months to get through this treatment, and then they can get vaccinated. So information like that uh, could be helpful to let an employer make an informed accommodation decision. But ultimately, an employer is entitled to supporting documentation for that exemption. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, we have about five minutes left, so maybe just one or two more questions. And uh, let's see, this one is a, a general question, no, not specific to COVID or anything like that. Uh, when the medical information from the doctor is vague, can we rely on the employee to provide information to fill in the gaps? Uh, or do we need to ask for additional information? I think that's a really good question. So, um, you know, is it ever okay to just talk to the individual, help that, let them fill in the gaps? Um, this person provided an example of uh, asking for voice recognition software but they, because they can't use a laptop right now. So just general thoughts and anyone, of course, jump in here on that. We love when employers talk to employees directly. We encourage that. Um, and Melanie and Teresa, feel free to chime in. But oftentimes, if an employer opens that conversation with the individual of what do you need, an employee will say exactly what they need. If they've had software at a previous job and they know specifically what they want, they can tell you that and kind of expedite that process. So we're not waiting on a healthcare provider to weigh in. And, you know, employees are the best source of information. They're the ones dealing with it. Um, so I definitely encourage talking to that employee directly. Absolutely. Yeah. Relying on somebody's lived experience can get you to a solution way faster. I think Melanie had something to say. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that the, the doctor's role is to document the disability and the limitations, but they may not know the best ideas for the accommodations. I, I think it's good to check with them if there are questions, but I, I agree with Lisa and I, I say this so much, but I think that full conversation with the employee and sometimes the employee is hesitant to give suggestions and then once prompted by the employer, I think that can turn into a really good conversation. Okay. Uh, I'm going to throw one more out. <laughs> um, so let's say somebody requests accommodations and they might not, may not ordinarily qualify for accommodations. So let's say it, it's something that maybe wouldn't meet the definition of disability under the ADA. What's your guidance if, if that's not the case, but we have somebody who's having some limitations in performing job duties? Um, should an employer consider providing accommodations? If it's something yes. quick and easy, why oh, not? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. You know, we hear from a lot of employers who say if it's quick and easy and it's inexpensive, we want all of our employers, our all employees to be happy and comfortable. You know, if it's something that's more involved or going to be expensive, then we're going to request like medical documentation to make sure they have a disability. But, but I think employers really think about, you know, what, what makes an employee comfortable and how can they best do their job? And if it's something quick and easy and not expensive, absolutely look at providing that for people. Yeah, I think that brings us back to sort of the practical approach to just ensuring that people can do their jobs. And if there's something easy that can be made and it's going to help everyone be successful, then why not? Certainly consider it. So uh, Jan's been around a long time. We've been around before. Private employers even had to provide accommodations. So we've been talking accommodation for many, many years now. All right. Well, I think that uh, we only have about two minutes left and I have a little bit of wrap up to do. So I'm going to pause right here and uh, mention uh, quickly just a little bit about uh, NDEAM. So uh, just to remind everyone that it is October and it's National Disability Employment Awareness Month or NDEAM. Uh, the 2021 NDEAM theme is America's Recovery Powered by Inclusion. And this reflects the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities have full access to employment and community involvement during the national recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to access the NDEAM poster provided by the Office of Disability Employment Policy, you can visit DOE dol.gov slash agencies slash ODEP. So we encourage everyone to, uh, to certainly celebrate the month with us and access that poster. 
unfortunately, that's, of course, all the time that we have today. So to my expert colleagues and, um, and good friends, uh, Melanie, Teresa, and Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise today. Your guidance is, um, it's certainly, it's going to help these participants today and as it has helped so many JAN customers. So thank you so much. I think it's going to help everyone realize they've got this, whatever it is. <laughs> Um, for additional information on the topics discussed today, please do contact Jan, go to askjan.org, call us toll free or contact us using live chat or email. Also, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter for tips, resources and Jan updates that you may find very interesting. Uh, thank you to ACS for providing captioning for this Jan training and finally don't close the Jan webcast browser before completing the evaluation. Uh, the CEU approval code will be provided after completing the evaluation. And please be sure to register for the November Jan webcast return to work after COVID-19 focus on mental health and cognitive limitations. Melanie will be one of the presenters along with her colleague James. So please do register for that event. We hope to see you then. Thanks everyone for attending today. This concludes our webcast.